So my name is Dr. Moyen C. Can you hear me okay at the back? Great. Um, I work at the Centre for Agroecology, uh, Water and Resilience at Coventry University, which is a new research centre, very recently launched, and um, we're really trying to uh, work on transdisciplinary research, which looks at the connected, interconnected problems facing food and water systems and how to make those systems resilient and uh, in particular how to enable uh, communities, citizens um, to be involved in, in, those, in those debates and in fact communities and citizens very often are at the forefront of um, developing solutions to some of the problems we're facing. Um, I noticed we've got the same catchphrase as RCUK, excellence with impact. <laughs> For those um, visitors to the UK, you may realise we're very, uh, all very interested in, in research with impact. Um, but this is partly because of our research excellence framework, but uh, in our case, this is genuine commitment to research with impact. Um, so, Jeanne uh, asked me to speak on uh, alternative food networks, theories, practice and challenges. And um, so, it's a very broad topic, so I thought that really, probably what, what was needed was a, a talk which would try to set the scene for the workshop, uh, maybe pose some questions and try to frame some of the discussions that take place over the next two days. And I know we have some really great speakers who will be speaking about the more specific uh, practices of using digital technology and also speaking about how to conceptualise scaling up um, as well. So my talk is more to consider alternative food networks. What do they mean? What are they? And um, does this matter? Great. So here's the plan for what I'm going to speak about. Um, my talk is uh, probably 25 minutes now. Um, alternative food networks, introducing the concept, and is it a chaotic concept? And if so, does it matter? Secondly, I want to just provide two examples of alternative food networks and the challenges which they may face in, in scaling up. This is just this is drawing from my own uh, research which I've done uh, myself and with colleagues over, over the years looking at alternative food networks. And then some brief ideas or suggestions for how to frame our thinking about scaling up and digital technologies. So, alternative food networks, a chaotic concept, does it matter if it is? Um, first of all, just to get the, the context right, um, the term alternative <coughs> food networks um, appeared in the research literature in, during the 1990s, really, so it goes back a little way, and the context of uh, the research and the activity around alternative food networks was around um, so food scares that were happening at the time. So the uh, as was popularly known, the mad cow uh, problem, the foot and mouth disease. But there were numerous uh, anxieties about food and its origins and safety and quality, which um, created a lot of media interest created consumers uh, awareness, uh, added to consumers awareness and questioning about where food comes from. There was also growing unease about climate change, about the environmental problems and how food systems were implicated in those. In Europe, in the European Union, we saw uh, policy initiatives to promote food quality, uh, to promote rural development and there was a real uh, interest in how rural development could be fostered through uh, using quality food products with a distinct place of origin which said something about their, their quality. And then th in North America, um, there was a growing politicised local food movement, um, very much concerned with issues around social and environmental justice. And these trends have been reviewed and, and summarised uh, well in the literature. Um, but they kind of coalesce to create this interest in alternative food networks. Um, uh, Tregea in 2011 provides quite a nice general definition which has been cited quite, quite a few times. So 
AFNs, I'll call them from now on, <laughs> forms of food provisioning with, with, char with characteristics deemed to be um, different from, perhaps counteractive to, mainstream modes which dominate in developed countries. So I've just highlighted AFNs, different from, counteractive to, and also developed countries because most of the literature has been concerned with developed countries and there are a few studies uh, which I know of which are looking at short food chains in developing countries for instance and local food systems but a lot of this work around the alternative was situated in the context of, of developed countries um, so that's I know that's a theme which is going to come back up in, in the workshop uh, the differences between context in developed and developing countries so the trouble with alternative, well the term <coughs> soon became problematic in the literature. A lot of the early work understood alternative as a binary uh, in opposition to conventional food systems. But as the research got underway and empirical case studies started to show that things were more complicated than that. So for example, studies on farm businesses using short food chains showed that those businesses would dip in and dip out of the conventional <coughs> food system. They would use long food chains and short food chains. So it problematised whether you can really call things alternative. And the other point was that a lot of the early work used the label alternative to stand for other things like local food or organic food or community food. And there were all, all these terms are... are, are problematic, difficult to define and complex. And so lots of questions were provoked by the research and, and case studies and the, and the practices happening. So for example, one, just a few questions. Is organic food still alternative if it's mass produced? So the work, uh, for example, on the Californian organic industry, uh, the idea of the conventionalization of the organic food industry started to raise a question Okay, is that still alternative then? Um, are high food miles always bad? So the work around local food, um, I'm thinking especially of the work by Edwards Jones and his team, which for instance looked at the environmental effects of local foods and then tried to then also balance that against the ethical effects of buying local, um, particularly for developing countries. Um, Another question, is it alternative to buy locally produced food from a supermarket? Um, I'll come back to that a bit later. So lots of questions. Another point is that if we think about things which are labelled as alternative, um, they often have historical roots and precedents. So in a, in a British context, for instance, the milk float, the fish van, home-grown food have long been part of urban food provisioning. So they're not always new things, but they do have their roots in the past and in, in practices that people do already know about. The pictures actually are, I don't know if you can see it, a horse-drawn milk float, apparently from 1978, somewhere in northern England, and that is the farmer delivering his milk. Um, also, traditional cultures and countercultural movements have practiced collaborative food systems, so we have these precedents that we can draw on and, and, and situate what's happening today in relation to those as well. So what's the problem then with alternative? Well, I've already raised some problems, but one issue is that when we talk about alternative versus conventional, it doesn't reflect real life complexities. And the same is true of the conventional food system. So what we call conventional food system is also heterogeneous, contested, <coughs> different things. Um, also, the people who are involved in what we label the alternative, they are, don't always think of themselves as that way or describe themselves in that way. Um, and the alternative is always positioned in relation to a powerful and dominant other. So, to quote Larch Maxi, who said that in perpetuating analysis of alternative foods, then we may inadvertently naturalize, normalize, and legitimize highly problematic practices and products which are labelled as conventional. So he's just questioning this power relation in how we label and we name things. Um, there's also, which has been 
this idea of romanticising alternative, this has been very well discussed in the literature, so I don't need to spend a long time, but just to point out, a lot of work has suggested that there's a danger to that you idealise concepts such as the local and the community, and you have to be careful not to do that. So Dupuy and Goodman have notably have written about this, and they talk about normative localism, which places uh, pure, conflict-free local values in contrast to an anomic and contradictory capitalist forces. But what they're arguing for is a much more complex reading of the way that um, localism is constructed and who is included and who's excluded. Other people have written, using different terms, so there's the well-known work on the local trap by Bourne and Purcell and Winter's paper on defensive localism. Similar ideas of questioning, well, what do we actually mean by the local? Does this matter, all this academic angst <laughs> about what we call things? <laughs> well, I think it does matter in the sense that it, we need to be clear about what we're talking about. So when we're talking about alternatives, which type of alternative do we mean? Um, alternative is a good, useful umbrella term for the moment until we think of something better. And there are new ideas, of course, coming out. And, I think civic food networks is an interesting new concept. Perhaps it's better. We're going to hear about it, I think, during this workshop. So, but the point is, depending on the different aims of the AFN, the digital technology may have a different role and a potential. And so we need to think then about what kind of food system we want. So that's probably one of the big questions that I wanted to put on the table to help frame the discussion. What kind of food system do we want to upscale to? Um, and there's lots of words that we might want to use, we might want to use. Sustainable, resilient, ethical, just, democratic, uh, caring, healthy, high animal welfare, traceable, <coughs> but affordable, convenient. There's so many demands that we want to make of our food system. So how could digital technology scale up to help us achieve some of those. So, I said I'd try and illustrate some of these points with reference to some examples. Um, so, I'm going to take two different examples. Firstly, a community supported agriculture. So, this is a type of alternative. Um, many of you will know about these already. These, these are producer consumer partnerships, committed <coughs> to sustainable production methods, maybe organic, maybe agroecology. Uh, biodynamic and so on. They are, there are different models of CSA and they're, they're more or less radical in their ambition. The more radical types require an enhanced involvement of the subscribers, the, the consumers or the citizens in the creation of their food and in simultaneously creating the communities around food. These CSAs are often regarded as transformatory because of this close engagement that they seek with the people who eat the food and with the people who grow the food or make it. They've been conceptualised in different ways, for example, as caring practice, as a way of expressing and practising an ethic of care for the environment and for other people, or recently, more recently described as civic food networks. Uh, the active involvement of citizens in their food systems. And also there's some really interesting work which uses uh, uh, non-representational theory to talk about the tactile involvement of people in the space of food production uh, with the materialities of food production. And so there's some interesting work which talks about um, the idea of affect which is a way of knowing our environment as humans, which is uh, different from emotion. It's a more of a, a pre-emotional or sub-emotional state, which we experience when we connect with, with, with the natural environment and with other people. And so some people are writing about how important this is in encouraging a commitment, sustained commitment to CSAs. So just to quote Hayden and, and Book, who did an interesting case study of the CSA, it would appear that engaging a good portion of members in the tactile space of the farm's physical environment is a critical means 
for creating a truly sustainable CSA because it's changing the relationship with food and with where the food comes from and with the people who are producing the food. It's decommodifying the food to an extent. So, challenges then for CSAs. Some of the main challenges, time pressure in our busy lives. Very difficult for people to commit time that, that they ideally would, would like to, uh, to growing food or being involved in the, the food production. So quite a lot of studies have shown that CSAs struggle to get the hands-on involvement that they ideally need. Access to land for growing, another issue. And also having that land for long enough to get the, the project established. Um, financial viability and self-exploitation. Uh, people, I think, are starting to talk about this more now. And uh, the idea that um, the farmers and the growers and the producers that are involved are... In some cases, they, they self-exploit. They take, a, they don't earn a great living, to put it bluntly, but they keep the project going because they're passionate and they're committed to it. Um, and they may actually shield the subscribers from the risks of farming, although the philosophy is that they're supposed to share it. But I think there's, there's a few studies now which are, are suggesting that that's not quite happening. Um, and there's a nice quote from a study by Galt who looked at 54 CSAs in California and just to quote one of the farmers he says the point of what we're trying to do is much bigger than grow food and make money I mean that's not even the point it's to live sustainably and create communities that are growing their own food so what's important is to recognise these are alternative rationalities for the way people behave and I was just <laughs> wandering around the internet looking for something interesting to stick in my presentation and uh, I found that. I thought that was really good. Um, yeah, I won't be impressed with technology until I can download food, but it, it just speaks to that, that material and embodied connection that you want with food and then so where does digital technology come in to that? Although somebody did tell me that he believes that we will soon be able to do it. So, leave that one with you. You probably know, people here know more about it. Okay, second example is short food chains. So, I've separated the CSAs from short food chains because I think that the short food chains are more, uh, let's say, more of a conventional relationship between the producer and the consumer, based on more of an exchange relationship. Um, but the key is that the, the chain is, is short either geographically or in terms of the number of links in the chain. So it could be a spatially extended chain, but it just has a, a minimum number of links between the producer and the consumer. So the product is full of information, but that may be uh, actually information about the producer and where he or she is and the place that they're in. It's about products that have a distinctive place origin usually, whether that be a farm or a region Generally, these are regarded as means for farmers to generate direct sales, immediate routes to market, and hopefully capture more of the added value of the food. For consumers, it means better traceability, transparency, able to reconnect with their food. Examples are farmers markets, farm shops, pick your own, uh, you know, strawberry picking on the farm. It's, it, it's a direct connection with, with, with the farm and the place of production. So what about sh challenges for short food chains? So this is, I'm trying to show a different set of challenges here. Um, so as opposed to the CSA example. So some of these challenges arise from some research that we did uh, finish last year for the European Commission when we looked in, in quite a lot of detail at short food chains. So I'm summarising. Consumers often don't know where to access food from short food chains. And one of the issues as well is that not all consumers can get to farms. So if you're doing on-farm sales, there's, there's a lot of consumers who can't get to a farm. And I was trying to think if I knew about any bus, buses that go to a farm, where you could jump on a bus and go to a farm. And, and I googled a bus on a farm, and that was the picture I got. <laughs> An old London bus. It looks a bit decrepit, but the thing is about the access to the produce. For remote rural areas, of course, that's even more difficult. 
the farmers or producers in those areas have logistical problems of how do you get your produce to market. Um, obviously, even more of an issue in, in developing countries, but in Europe too, um, it does create problems. Um, also, the communications difficulties, if they don't have reliable internet access, then that puts a barrier to, to the internet connection with people. Um, there's issues around small producers, and I know we're going to talk about this in the workshop, how do they meet demand for large quantities and consistent quality of food for large scale, larger customers, like public sector, for instance. Small businesses in food, just, just as in other sectors, have limited resources for marketing and promotion. They might not also have the skills to engage with digital technology, especially some of the farm-based businesses where the older farmers um, may not feel they're able to engage with that or have the skills. There's also some issues, I think, which are similar to what I said about the CSA, where sometimes there seems to be um, a danger of a burnout if it's very small-scale producers who are running their farm, growing their produce, trying to do direct marketing, going to the farmer's market, and <coughs> that's a lot of work for one or two or a small family business to, to cope with. And the economic return and is, is debated, so I think it, it, you can look at it different ways, different studies, some, some studies are very positive and show that it really can help small farmers and, and others are questioning and a lot of this is to do with context of where the farm is and where their market is and what product, what sector they're working in as well. Um, and also the, the bigger issue is about the power relations as well and whether these types of short food chains are transformatory of the food system. And I just said I would touch on supermarkets because I think this is really important uh, and just to put this out, are they a challenge or a threat for, or an opportunity, sorry, <laughs> got that wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, challenge or opportunity for scaling up. And uh, just, um, you know, supermarkets are very able to mimic short food chains and they are mimicking them. This is just a couple of photos from, uh, it's a bit blurry, but the one on the left is from Booth's supermarket in Lancashire where they've got a forgotten foods theme. So tapping into the nostalgia and the that's part of the whole discourse around reconnecting with food, artisan food products. The pi they're, they're showing pictures of the producers. They're trying to embody you know, this c connection with, with the producer and showing where the food's from. So more can bay shrimps, you probably can't see it, but it's very specific where this food is from. Uh, in Sainsbury's, they've got a picture of the farmer and they talk about growing relationships, which is the language of a CSA, <coughs> and it's the language of reconnection. So they are mimicking this, this language, and, um, but whether they are mimicking the, the, the types of structures that, that sit behind that language in a CSA or a short food chain, that's another question. And, and so I think, you know, what do you think? Do you, what do you, it depends on your view. You, either, you think supermarkets are great because they enable more access to local foods and they, they're the way for producers to connect with their markets. Or you might think, no, because they're just reproducing these power relations and, and inequalities in the food system that we don't like. So I'll leave that for a debate. <coughs> Moving on then, just to, to wrap up, and a few thoughts to, to help frame the discussion. Um, so only three points um, to try and summarise a bit what I've been saying. So I think digital technology can clearly address many practical challenges facing alternative food networks, and we're going to hear about that. But I think we also need to recognise that AFNs face different types of challenges, depending on what type of AFN they are and um, what they want to try and achieve. Um, so I think that's the, at least the second point, which is that for us it's important to keep reflexive about what AFNs are, but also about what we mean by the conventional food system. And you know, there's a heck of a lot of focus on, on AFNs, but we need to look at what the supermarkets are doing and the, the, the big guys as well. The, you know, and we need to, to we need to see how these things operate together. 
I, I think it's good. I, I like the idea of working with a pragmatic politics of the possible. So the CSA, short food chains, their experiments, their attempts to try things, doing things differently, and, and uh, you know that that to me seems the, the only way to, to progress is to try try and. And uh, fortunately, there are many people who are passionate enough to do that. And then, for a transformed food system, if that's what we want, um, can digital technologies enable democratic participation and civic engagement in local food networks? Because I think that's also a really important area, is how do people, citizens, engage and connect with, with these, these issues and these futures? So, uh, thank you very much.